Hey, welcome to Medical Stuff. My name is Mark Frankham. This is Chris. Yes, this is my wife. I promise I have a piece of paper to fix, uh, uh, prove it. Fingston and his wife is joining us today. This is Jesse. Yes, I know where, hip, where Hypnol is. And no, he did not use it to get me to marry him, <laughs> Fingston. <laughs> I actually had to sit there and like, what is real Hypnol? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. right? So uh, this evening we're going to be talking about female genitalia. So Chris and I being non-experts on these things, we figured bring in a person who has female uh, genitalia to uh, correct us on there, most things. There's an extremely douchey thing I could have said, but I didn't yeah. say it. Yeah, there's uh, so, many things here. So Speaking of douchey vagina, things, we're talking about the vagina today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so actually, Jesse, tell us a little bit about yourself. Introduce yourself to the audience. Well, like Mark said, I am the other uh, Fingston in the EMS world. I'm a senior paramedic. I've uh, been a paramedic for about six years now. Yeah, racking up. <laughs> Time flies when you're having fun. Okay, so uh, you uh, you come from a dynasty of uh, paramedics, if I understand correctly. I do. It uh, runs in the family. It does. Uh, Jesse's Jesse's mom is also a paramedic with the company we work for, and you'll be hearing her hopefully on a, on a future episode. Yeah. So. So I'm a paramedic with a vagina, and I've had babies. So. There we go. That you makes you I'm officially an expert in this room. Right. Well, so. and more of an expert than either Chris or I. Yes. So. <laughs> hey, okay. So basically, I was there for each baby when they got born. Baby so making. Pretty you're, sure. You're, you're, oh, you know, that's you right. couldn't. Hardcore hand holding. He did. Yeah. Because <laughs> that's what really makes a difference. No, really. She squeezed so hard that my hand hurt. So really. He complained once that his back hurt from helping to hold my leg up. <laughs> it was I, my back. I, was I my almost shot. murdered him. It was my shoulder and for the record <laughs> there's no records you can record, record, stand on here i did it because i thought i was being funny as they're like sewing me back together he's like oh like it's really hurts <laughs> i'm like you should run yeah now. well so it's funny so it's interesting because i said it because i thought i was being funny but a few months before that we took a class about having your first kid and the instructor literally said guys i know you think you're funny <laughs> right after the birth don't say anything. She will remember it forever, and she's not in a good place to deal with your humor. And you did not heed that advice. I did not. I, did not. <coughs> I will tell you this right now. Antlers. I am not above going and getting uh, pads or any sort of feminine uh, need. Good man. Purchases. Good man. The thing I hate about doing it is those bastards change the packaging constantly, so you can never remember which one it is when you get there to buy it. I have spent a lot of time on those aisles. That <laughs> when you have me buy those and makeup. Those are like the two things where I'm sitting there, I'm like, holy shit. Or pregnancy right. tests. Oh, yeah. God. So, <laughs> do you want to tell that story? Sure. That I uh, When we were first married, I sent him to the store to buy a pregnancy test, and he came back with this huge box, and he was like, I finally found him. And he's like, it's kind of misleading that there's a baby on the box. Which, by the way, he, we did not want to be pregnant. He at had this bought time. like a Costco sized box of ovulation tests. <laughs> and I was like, these are not pregnancy tests. These are the exact um, opposite. So I had right. like $40 worth of ovulation <laughs> tests. And, and that's the last time you sent Chris to the store yes, for anything and important. This is not when we were trying to have right. children. And so I was like, no, go back. The ones with the plus and the minus. Like, Last story for me here for a bit. Uh, my mom. When we lived in Canada, went to the store to get Tampax. She came back from the store, apparently, extremely pissed off. Uh, the store she went to was the only one that was open at the time. Remember, it's the 70s. It was a small corner market that was owned by a uh, very nice couple who were uh, from Asia. And the guy thought she kept saying uh, thumbtacks. <laughs> <laughs> and came back with thumbtacks, and she didn't have the heart or the energy at that point to explain to him what she needed. Because all she could think of was he'd be standing there thinking, you're going to do what with him? <laughs> <laughs> so, awesome. if this starts, and for some reason the, the woman that you're with is not prepared, which happens. You go to the box to get the next one, and it's empty. Go buy them some some products. Or give you're, them your sock. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> so, go buy them some product, because not only are they uncomfortable, and it's actively happening, they don't want to have to drive and walk through a grocery store and deal with all of this. Be a man. Just go buy them some product. So Agreed. Agreed. Although, generally, you're non-fertile at this point, people have been known to get pregnant during this. Yes? Um, it's possible. It's possible. So, if you become fertilized during that time, 
Don't look at me like that. Okay, I'm not asking for your personal <laughs> stories, okay? Uh, so if you come where fertile... where babies come from. Right. Uh, if you become fertile during that time, hopefully you will have a normal gestation. Some of the pro- things that can go wrong is you can actually become... Uh, the egg can be uh, fertilized in the fallopian tube, which will cause what's called an ectopic pregnancy. The uterus, if you were to look at it, it looks essentially the shape of a light bulb. And at the top, you have these arms. That's the, that's the fallopian tubes. At the end of those fallopian tubes are almost little fingers that interface with the ovaries, and ovaries produce eggs. Where that egg should be impreg- uh, sorry, where the egg should have been planted and been fertilized is in the body of that light bulb. Lots of room to grow. If it ends up in a fallopian tube, not a lot of room. The right. fallopian tube is about as big around at its widest point, about as big around as your thumb. And imagine growing a baby there. We're not going through very long. No. And one of the things that can happen, though, is you can rupture. Right. That's what we call a ruptured ectopic pregnancy, and that can cause massive, life-threatening internal bleeding. Right. And it's because of this that, as medical professionals, if you're a female and you're of childbearing years, you'll be asked if there's a chance that you're pregnant. Especially if one of your symptoms is abdominal pain. Right. Yeah, it's usually the first eight weeks is kind of that, you know, period where it's definitely possible because, you know, when, you know, you pee at home, you get the positive, you Mm -hmm. call the doctors, they usually don't even see you till eight to ten weeks of pregnancy. And so you get those women, they've had that at home positive pregnancy test. They haven't seen a doctor yet. They haven't had that initial ultrasound to confirm that the eggs implanted where it should be, and then, yeah, all of a sudden they're having that severe abdominal pain, you know, right. high high chance of ectopic. Now, the problem with this is asking women this, is that if unless a woman is actively trying to get pregnant and they're of childbearing years, well, here, Jesse, are you pregnant right now? No. Right. That is going to be the answer you're going to get 90% of the time, unless, right. like I said, the woman is trying to get pregnant at that point. So um, it leads to an awkward conversation that you have to have, okay, there's only really two ways you can say you're 100% not pregnant. One is you don't have the parts. You had a hysterectomy, something along those lines. And I tell the patients, and I don't want to know specifics. (laughs) The only other way to be able to say 100% that you're not pregnant is to, uh, with no sexual activity. Right. No vaginal penetrative sexual activity. So really what it comes down to, I mean, for me, it's, are you sexually active? Right. And I'll even consider it a possibility then because it could be very well. And I don't know if you've had this call, Mark, or if you've had this, Jesse, but a lot of times we'll go on um, people who are inexperienced in what sexually active could possibly mean. Right. They're inexperienced in what uh, can get them pregnant. Maybe they don't know. They're very young. And, but sexually active or sexual activity might give you, yes, I am. But if you ask the question of, could you be pregnant, they might say no when really they could. Right. Well, the thing is, is there's a lot of information out there that's just flat out wrong. No. When I was talking to my daughter about uh, having the conversation with her, you know, I said to her, I go, well, you will hear a lot of very false things. Uh, One of the I read many years ago that I just thought was chuckly. If you drink ice water after sex, it freezes your internal (laughs) organs and you can't get pregnant. (laughs) <laughs> I, I told her that one, and she looked at me and she goes, people fall for that? <laughs> Sometimes. If you have not had good sex education, then you don't know what's true and what's not true. Right. If so, you're on birth control, and you do something... Always a chance. Always a chance. <laughs> and you take uh, antibiotics, it will decrease the efficacy of the birth control. Some birth control, for example, the Nuva ring. It's a ring that's vaginally inserted. has to be refrigerated. What if it's not refrigerated at the proper temperature? You know, that can decrease the effect of well, and even, Before I mean, or after insertion? Before. <laughs> before. Well, Although, even, even all birth control. I mean, there's always that, you know, 99 point. Right. Manufacturing um, defects happen. Well, and I mean, just the, you know, the standard pill. It's the pill you take it daily, but it's also supposed to be at the same time every day, you know. Right. Most, I mean, there's... Well, it has a very short action action time, so that if you don't take it, if you take it the morning of Monday, but you take it Tuesday afternoon, it's already worn off. And then if you have sex before, that's really had a chance to take effect to, to get you back up to that therapeutic level. Because what does the birth control pill do? And I'm getting blank stares from everybody in the room. It uh, convinces your body that you're pregnant, so it doesn't release the egg. 
Now, if you do have a proper implantation and fertilization of the egg, at that point you have about 40 weeks before you're going to be delivering a child, mm -hmm. as long as everything goes well before the, you know during that time. Now, what are some of the things that go wrong during the pregnancy? Oh. Okay, you, you, look, you look at me like I'm going to give There's you the answer. There's a myriad so. <laughs> of things. Um, there are various complications. You know, the most popular ones are obviously like gestational diabetes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, women are tested. Popular. Yes. Yeah. I'll take gestational right, diabetes. Right. And... All of all of us that have had the joys of pregnancy have gotten to drink the disgusting sugar drink and go through that test and. Yeah, after I drank because, that, I because, I've yeah. never made a patient drink D50 again because I've always been like, oh, it's not that bad. And, you know, and then I drink it and I was like, oh my God. Because, you know, during pregnancy, your stomach's so settled oh, and yeah. firm, you know. It's oh, not, it's... And I had GD with all of my pregnancies and so I was already like barfy to begin with. So like throw that on top of it and they're like, just sit here for four hours and you're like, it's torturous. It's. <laughs> It's bad. Um, the gestational diabetes, and obviously with that, there's risk to the mom and the baby. A lot of larger birth weights, so that can make delivery complicated as well. Um, gestational hypertension is another one. So that's when a woman develops hypertension following the 20th week of pregnancy. So and, this, and hypertension is high, high blood pressure. Yes, it is high blood pressure. Um, if it occurs before the 20th week, it's considered chronic hypertension that's just kind of been unmasked by pregnancy. If it's after 20 weeks, then it's considered because of the pregnancy. Um, and then the risk with that, um, I had that with both of my pregnancies and um, all I was told from my doctors and the perinatologist was um, they are starting to treat it more like preeclampsia because it can morph into preeclampsia. Um, but it also has, you know, when you get into that severe gestational hypertension, it has the same really harmful effects on both mom and baby. And so um, it's kind of morphing into the same category. Right. And then severe gestational hypertension is usually that blood pressure of um, 160 over 90 or higher. Okay. Um, so that's kind of when you get into the severe category. Um other complications. Let's talk a little bit about preeclampsia. Right. Eclampsia. So, preeclampsia. So, eclampsia is when you're having seizures. Right. So, that's the defining characteristic between yes. preeclampsia and eclampsia yes. is when you seize. Yes. So, if you're eclamptic, you've gotten to the point where you're having seizures because of this. Um, preeclampsia um, used to have really strict kind of diagnoses and it's gotten a little broader uh, now it's kind of a myriad of symptoms you have that high blood pressure right. um, other symptoms are headache sudden weight gain obviously like weight gain is common in pregnancy but we're talking five pounds in two days ten right. pounds in a week like that sudden now is that a lot of that is that uh, water weight is that what you collected it's, because it tends to be fluid right. um, and it's also, I mean, it can be all over, but the really worrisome is your, you know, feet is normal, but, you know, you see normal pregnancy swollen feet, and then you see preeclampsia swollen feet, and it's, it is, you know, a little different, can be a little different, but it's the hands and the face. Like, I ended up with preeclampsia in my last pregnancy, and you can see, like, you know, right before I delivered, like, my face, and I remember my hands the night before, like, it just... It felt like it was hard to close my hands into a fist, you right. know, because it wasn't, you know, necessarily like, super obvious. It's not like Pillsbury Doughboy hands all of a sudden, <laughs> but, you know, you could just tell, like, the swelling was starting. Right. Um, and then, like, uh, right-sided pain, mm -hmm. um, visual disturbances. Why right-sided? Um, and I don't know is an acceptable <laughs> answer. Just so you know, because I'm going to throw questions out, and I don't know. He does but, this to me all the time. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, I believe it's like the... What I do it to Chris is because I know the answer. I'm trying to make him look bad, though. <laughs> Mark knows something. Right. He wants to show us. It's the liver, isn't it? I think... The... I don't know. I'm I asking. think it's the oh, liver. Oh, you actually like, don't know. It's yeah. like the liver, kidney. Um, I just remember, like, when I was in the... Um, I ended up... I was an inpatient at St. Vincent's for five weeks with my last pregnancy, and every day it's the same thing. <laughs> 
any headache, any visual disturbances, any pain, and, you know, so you're so used to... Right. So I can at least rattle off the symptoms now. Um, well, but I, I think it has to just do with the whole... <coughs> Right. You know, just liver, kidney function. And when you start getting that like stabbing abdominal pain, it could be a sign of. Well, preeclampsia and then subsequently eclampsia are uh, products of the body's inability to handle the extra stress put on your, re- on your body by having the pregnancy. The added uh, waste product and everything like that. Is that correct? Yes. Um, well, and there, yeah, and there's, you know, there's a lot more information coming out and they're doing a lot more research as far as like the causes. Um, Most of my doctors um, said it, they're discovering it's uh, related to the placenta and how the, how the placenta attaches Mm -hmm. and um, that's, you know, kind of what leads to it. Um, Cause I remembered when I was in the hospital, you know, I asked about like caffeine and basically they're like, this is all internal, like nothing, you're doing is affecting this, you know, so it's, you know, if your blood pressure spikes, it's not going to be the mocha you had. It's, (laughs) you know, there's all this stuff going on inside the body. Yeah. So your body's just unable to process the waste products and the stress that's been put on by the pregnancy. And then you have these symptoms that go along with it. You have the, like you said, the variance of symptoms as it gets, as it progresses, Mm -hmm. you have the, but the big one initially that they worry about is the blood pressure. That's usually like one of the first signs that make them start thinking about the patient. Yes, being yes, blood pressure, uh, protein in the urine. Even though they are finding that not all women throw protein when they are preeclamptic, um, I didn't start throwing protein until the day I was induced, um, and so that's not a defining factor. Like if someone has yeah. the high blood pressure and any of the other symptoms, they're you know, right. they're sticking them in that category now because they know that, you know, if they wait until they, because, you know, the protein is basically just saying, like, okay, like, your kidneys aren't right. doing what they need to do. And now, so, is it actually showing any sort of damage being done to the kidneys? Is that with the protein in the urine? Um, Again, I, I, I don't know. Right. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know the technicalities of it. Um, I just know I peed in more buckets my last pregnancy than I ever anticipated I would. Um, they do a lot of, like, 24-hour urine catches where you literally, like, pee in a hat and pour it in a big bucket that's on ice for a day. So when she says pee in a hat, uh, they have a bedside commode. No, it's yeah. just a that, top hat. Yeah. <laughs> they have a, a bedside hat. commode that has an inverted collect, a collection container they call them the hat. So she's not actually peeing in somebody's hat. Although yes. that would be a way to get back to your doctors for right. treating you like this. Right, right. Yeah. But yeah, they do closely track that because once you start throwing protein, it's, I know it's a bad, it's a bad sign. Um, so you mentioned that you're on bed rest. So that's really the primary treatment initially it's, is you just. Because you want to reduce the amount of stress of the body. And if you're trying to go to work or get up and move around and take care of your daily life otherwise, that adds to the stress that is already being, your body is already not really handling. You yeah. raise your blood pressure yeah, as well, the blood, which is yeah. going to be already high. Right. Yeah, maintaining that blood pressure. Um, and obviously, whenever you start developing complications, the goal is always, you know, how far they can get you. Um, and... You know, they've come a long way in their but management. But how far you, they can get you, I mean, how far in your gestation they can get you yes. before they take the baby. Yes. Okay. So, like, I know my last pregnancy, um, we really, you know, the first time we had a scare, I was 23 weeks, and then things kind of mellowed out, and then 28 weeks was when I got admitted for the long haul, and at that point, you know, the goal, it was mild. And the goal was to get to 34 weeks, and we ended up making it to 36 weeks. And so, overachiever, Mm -hmm. right? Yay. Um, (laughs) We did it. Um, But yeah, so, you know, their, you know, goal was okay, we're going to aim for 34 weeks. Obviously, if something happens. Um, But, you know, as far as managing it, you know, I uh, got to do a magnesium drip twice, which um, brings down the blood pressure. helps prevent seizures. I also learned it's good for the baby's brain. I didn't realize that until I had the personal joy of taking it. (laughs) I'd had a lot of patients that had been on mag that had told me how bad it was. Mm -hmm. So I took it myself and I was like, that shit is 
horrible. So when you say <laughs> personal joy, you mean... Yes, I've had it twice, mm-hmm. and I've had a few mag patients since then, mm-hmm. and I'm just like, I feel you. <laughs> like, <laughs> here's some ice packs. Like, it's horrible. It's like menopause and having a stroke, like, all at the same time. Uh-huh. Like... I was not a fan of that medication. And to learn more about strokes, uh, right. listen to last <laughs> week's podcast on... Uh... <laughs> so, like you said, they try and get you as far along in your gestation as they can. And now there's hallmarks during your gestational period where they're like, okay, if you get to this point, then this amount of development should have hurt, uh, should have occurred. And from what I understand is they've really moved that point back to about 20, 21 weeks where you still could have a viable child, even if you have to deliver at that point. So one of our local hospitals here in Oregon actually uh, had, I don't know if, I don't know if it still is, but at the time it was the youngest uh, live birth into a healthy child at 19 weeks. Wow. Yeah. Talk about overachievers. Right, really? Yeah. <laughs> Showing off. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, what I did learn, we... Um, Got to meet with a lot of, like, perinatologists this last pregnancy. And, uh, like I said, when we first started having complications, we were 23, almost 24 weeks. And I know in paramedic school, we'd always been taught, like, 24 weeks viability. Like, that was the big, right. you know, poster mark of, like, okay, if you have this baby, there's a chance it could be alive. Well, because and, at 24 weeks, you have things like lung development. And the baby has developed to the point that it, it has all the parts it needs. Yes. So and before that, you don't necessarily have everything. It's like building a building, and you decide to open it before all the stairs are put in, right. <laughs> or you know, right. the electrical's done. There's right. Be problems. But, exactly. But what we did learn, um, which was scary, very scary at the time, was you know, at 24 weeks, yes, there's a chance of viability, but mm-hmm. you're still looking like 50-50. Right. So you know, we were still like, if we had to deliver that day, there was still a 50 percent chance of either the baby dying or having severe disabilities. And right. we actually had to have the talk about, you know, um, resuscitation wishes and treatment wishes. Which is something every parent wants oh, to Oh, yeah, have you know, that's, child, that's you know. where you think you're at, you know, in your second trimester. And, um, and then once you reach 28 weeks, you're looking at kind of a, at least, again, this is a discussion I had with my doctor. I, right. You'd have to Google to, don't quote me on this, um, but 28 weeks, you're looking at more of that like 75% chance, or I think it was 80% chance, um, which again, going up from 50 looked a lot better. So, right. you know, like that day in the hospital, you know, we're like, okay, if we can get to 28 weeks, and then once we hit 28 weeks, okay, if we can get to 30, if we can get to 30, because what... 34 um, was pretty much, you're up in the, the 90th percentiles as far as um, having a healthy right. baby. Yeah, they might have some NICU time, but, right. you know, the chances of them, you know, their mortality rate or their chances for severe disabilities, like, greatly dropped at that point. So you'll hear, with high-risk pregnancies, you'll hear 34 weeks as kind of right. the general goal. At, at 34 weeks... The, the, the finishing work's being done after 34 weeks. Yes, yes. But that <laughs> was mean, definitely my misconception. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was definitely my misconception, though, as a paramedic, is I had always assumed, like, 24 weeks, like, yeah, they'd be, they'd be tiny, but right. they're viable, but then you forget about, okay, but, you know, there's still a 50, that 50% chance that, right. you know, they won't make it, and then just kind of how it stepped up from there, and I was like, okay, like, I had always thought 24 was that. Well, it's more than 24 weeks. You at least have a There's chance. There's a chance. There's yes. a chance. You know, I'm sure there have been twenty you know, plenty of children born at twenty four weeks that have turned out completely normal, mm-hmm. but there's still a huge chance that something is gonna go seriously wrong. Yes. You know? Yes, definitely. And even still, uh, so once you even get up to the gestational age, there's complications with delivery after that. Right. As well. So there are several different types of presentations uh, that a child can deliver. Ideally, head first. Right. Uh, head first with the uh, umbilical cord uh, in its place where it should be, which is not around the neck. Um, not around the neck. Not around the okay. neck. Okay. You know, it doesn't sound obvious, but... Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and then that is just a uh, normal vaginal birth. But there are some other complications that can occur. So, one complication that can occur, uh, even if the baby is delivered in the ideal position, which is head down, is something called meconium aspiration. Right. Now, meconium is baby poop. 
the baby actually produces waste. Normally the waste is going to be taken out during the, through the umbilical cord of the center and the mom's going to take care of that. Baby's going to, mom's going to poop for the baby. <laughs> but sometimes the baby can actually defecate in utero. Yeah. And so meconium is a mixture of that poop as well as <clears throat> other fluids. And inhaling that or aspirating that uh, in through the airways is detrimental to the baby's health because it's thick, it's tarry, and it can uh, block the passage of air. So one of the first things that we'll do from the paramedic side, or what your doctor will do, is immediately examine that airway, and if need be, suction and clear. Right. Okay. So another presentation that can be bad is let's say we're not in the ideal position. I actually tell you what, let's stick with the ideal position, but one of the things that can happen is that the cord uh, the umbilical cord can wrap around the patient's neck. Well, the problem with that is, is that the cord's only so long. Yeah. And generally not long enough to extend out at the same time the head is. And so as the baby's pushed out, that cord tightens. Right. You know, and I'm sorry if this is a crass term, but it's basically like a noose. And it will uh, essentially choke the child. Right. And so that can be taken care of in, in several ways. If it's wrapped... It can be wrapped more than once around the neck. And sometimes if it's too tight, the only option at that point is a C-section. Vaginal delivery isn't possible or practical. Um, if the baby presents and is coming out, the cord can be slipped over the head as the baby's being delivered vaginally. And then that's one way to get around. Hopefully. Hopefully. Uh, and then let's see. There's also breach presentations. Do you want to talk mm -hmm. about breach presentations? Yes. So... Uh, what most people imagine with breech presentations is butt first, which is definitely not how babies are uh, designed to come out of the vagina. <laughs> well, because it creates a problem because with during a normal delivery, the head is going to be the hardest part to deliver. Mm -hmm. It's going to be the widest, the biggest. So once the head is out... Really it can... quick. Is it, Jesse? The head is definitely the hardest part. <laughs> it's not called the Ring of Fire for fun and games. It's not a carnival ride. Well, but what can happen is you can actually have something of an explosive delivery after the head is delivered. Yeah. Yes, the, the head is the big part, which is pretty much why anytime anything comes before the head, right. it can be problematic because... If the head isn't going to fit, you don't want to find out after the rest of the body is out. Right. You know, with a buttocks first, or butt first, or BF, <laughs> uh, the BF problem is, is that the baby is now going to be folded in half, and that's an even larger concept trying to get out through the vaginal mm -hmm. opening. And so, how do we fix this? Yes. So, are, uh, are and then instructions for the baby early on. Right. right. And then there are also like footling, which is when you have a foot or a leg that presents first, which is its own ball of fun, or um, a limb presentation again, you know, the arm. Right. Um, pretty much anything that's not a head, you don't want right. to see when the woman says she's having a baby and you go to look. If you're, if you're going to be delivering a baby, you want the baby looking back at you first. Right. right. Now, the thing is, right, in a pre-hospital setting, there's really nothing we can do for this. No, there's not. You know. Uh, obviously, historically... The right. drive fast and drive faster protocol. Right. Uh, historically, obviously, this there were ways of working through this. None of them are good. But, you know, throughout history, women have presented like this. Babies have presented like this. And so there had to be something. But... It was generally very traumatic for the baby. You can run into things like, especially with like the cord around the neck, you can run into a child with an anoxic brain injury, which is where the brain did not get enough oxygen. Uh, you can also cause too much trauma to the mother, and they will start bleeding. Uh, you know, these days where I think they're uh, not aggressive, but they're much more cognizant of needing to do an episiotomy, which mm -hmm. is where they actually widen the vaginal opening through incisions. Or the baby does it on their own. Why do you keep looking at her? I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> uh, I got one of those too. Right? <laughs> also fun. <laughs> so real quick. So yes, this can be traumatic to the woman, uh, causing tearing of the vaginal opening, which can then lead to obviously a lot of bleeding. Yeah. And one of the things that they will try and do during the prenatal care process, if they recognize that a baby is not in the prime position, which is head down, there are some things they can do to try and flip the baby the right direction. Handstands. Yes. Yeah, exactly. But no, they'll actually try and manipulate from the outside. It's one of the things that they can do. Right. 
So speaking of prenatal care, there's been a lot of trends in prenatal care lately. Okay. Well, so I would say probably the most common thing that a lot of us, or at least what we thought, Jesse and I thought of when it came to prenatal care was um, we get an OB, we have our baby at a hospital. But now we're starting to see an upward trend in uh, an upward trend in home birth, right? And natural birth. And do you have some statistics on that off the top of your head? If you don't, that's fine. Um, we I know we use Oregon used to be the second highest home birth rate in the nation. Uh, we were beat out by Montana, and I don't remember if we are still maintaining number two or if we. We might have gotten bumped down to number three, um, but we are up there in in the United right. States as far as our our number of of home births. And these are people that voluntarily stay home. They have a midwife usually that comes out to the home for the delivery of the baby. Uh, midwifery is a very old traditional uh, position. It's becoming, I believe, more regulated through the medical profession. How's it been? Yeah. You know, uh, and a lot of these are also going to be uh, natural births in a, like a water birthing situation. Right. You even have water birthing centers now, which, mm-hmm. of course, I guess wouldn't technically be a home birth, but it is a different environment to have a it's baby. An out of hospital birth. And I know, right. our, like, in Oregon, <clears throat> the um, state is starting to track it more closely, like, on the, you know, birth, all the information they collect for birth certificates as right. far as... Like you said, planned versus unplanned, and then, you know, what type of facility or facilitator maybe right. was was used. Um, and so hopefully we'll start to have more concrete statistics. I think there's one report out from the Oregon Health Authority that has some recent statistics on what type of home births we're looking at or out-of-hospital births. Um, but I think in, like, five years, we're going to know a lot more. Right. And we, we are seeing it. I mean, I've seen these. We've all been on these calls. And one of the problems is is that you can run into uh, a myriad of problems, and we're generally called fairly late in the process. So the patient right. is already deteriorating by the time you get there. I have what we went on one call. It wasn't too far from where uh, Jesse and Chris live, actually. And we didn't have good information. We really didn't know what the chief complaint was. Come in, speaker. Just so we didn't really know what the chief complaint was. And we show up on scene, and I go walking in the door. And as I'm walking through the living room, there's an inflatable pool that somebody obviously just delivered a baby. And I'm like, <laughs> well, I know what type of call it is now anyway. Still not sure. There's a lot of fruit punch. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, it's... I don't know exactly what the call is, but I'm pretty sure it's baby related. Yeah. So, and as it happened, the baby was fine. Mom was having an issue. So, one of the things, though, and this is very controversial, this can be a very controversial subject how mm-hmm. you have your baby and where you have your baby. Um, one of the things, though, that people do need to be aware of, one of the advantages to having a baby in a hospital is that if co- unforeseen complications occur, you're there. Mm-hmm. And a lot of these complications, time really, really matters. When we're talking about, we mentioned hypoxic brain injuries earlier in children as they're being born. That minutes are critical. Minutes right. determine the difference between a baby with a normal life ahead of them and a baby that's going to have extra challenges. Or a, or a death during delivery. Absolutely. Yeah. And so another big important factor to having a home birth is that it's really important that you still maintain good prenatal care. When you're having a home birth and you're going to be away from those resources, good prenatal care can help you know if you're going to be having a higher risk than normal. And it can help you make that decision as it comes time to give birth. Should I have this baby in a hospital or not? Right. You know, home birth can still be the goal. And absolutely have respect for people that, or respect people's decision to have a home birth. Well, the thing about having a home birth is that uh, not only do you not have the specialists there, but mm-hmm. generally you don't have the medications you would be able to have access to at a hospital. So right. these women are truly having a natural birth scenario where they are feeling every inch of that pain. Yeah, but they absolutely. But I, I do think it's important for people that are having baby to be absolutely aware of the, uh, of the risks and prepare themselves to navigate those risks as they go forward with good prenatal care. Everybody wants to have the highest percentage, percentage chance of having a successful delivery. Yeah. Yes, so it educate is. educate yourself on what that means. It mm-hmm. is trending, though, as far as 
high-risk women that are getting turned away from those birthing centers are choosing to have home births right. because they're so adamant about not having hospital births. So breach, twins, we're starting to see a lot more of those right. at home, which definitely should not be right. home births, in my humble paramedic opinion. Well, I mean, <laughs> people have varying, varying ideas on what they believe is Western medicine. Yes. But there should always be a point where you're like, okay, well, this is going to be a, there's a good enough chance here that I need to rely on this because right. the Western medicine does a lot of things very well. Right. <laughs> you know. So if you can't have a vaginal delivery, what are your options? Well, reabsorbing the child back into your body. Stay <laughs> pregnant forever. <laughs> Unfortunately, not an option. We found out. Oh, yeah. Well, I didn't really check my references when I was doing research there. So most com- most commonly is, is the cesarean section or the C section, right? And that is basically just cutting in through the abdomen, making another hole, and taking the baby out that way. <laughs> How did you describe? I had an emergency C section this oh. last pregnancy, and he like he <laughs> described it like I was. Gutted like a fish. <laughs> I don't know. Well, or something was, boy, to you, that effect. You think you're a real yuckmeister in these times of stress. Don't you know, you? the best part about that though is she was pretty sedated. So I don't know if you remember everything I said during there. Maybe you do. I don't. I just remember I watched afterward. I watched some YouTube videos of emergency C sections because right. that's always smart. Like watch yeah. videos of what they just did to you, and I was like, Jesus Christ! They just like rip out like they cut the hole and then well, they're, they're like literally gentle. like this is not yarding, yeah. you know yeah. um and he was like oh yeah they just gutted you like a f- they just ripped you right open and i was like oh, oh that makes sense why i'm sore like right. yeah it was it was because uh so our our youngest child he ended up having the cord wrapped around his neck twice and so during so unfortunately she got the joy of being of going through the process of becoming fully dilated and starting to have Pushing. a vaginal birth, oh. and got all that ring of fire, and then the joy of also having a C-section. Yes. And so they went in for an emergency C-section, and it was it wasn't minutes when they made the decision to do it that they were that they that open pulling baby out. Right. It was just that fast. And this is why doing your research prior to mm-hmm. delivery. And I will yes. tell you this: we had no mm-hmm. indicator until it was time to give birth right. that a cesarean section was going to be necessary. No right. indicator. What gave it away was, of course, because they had heart monitoring that they could do prior to the baby being born. They saw that every time she pushed, his heart rate would drop really, really low. Right. And so we went into the OR. And the way I have described it, if you've ever seen Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, and there's the guy who uh, puts his hand on another guy's chest and rips his heart clean out, just like that, Mm -hmm. but Dr. Abdomen Baby comes out. Well, thank God he has good aim, so I they, guess, like, then. put so the they... curtain up so the women can't see right. this right. process. Right. Oh, damn it, that's a kid. Um, <laughs> but you're right, but it is amazing. I mean, I was I was in the perinatal specialty care unit at St. Vincent, so I'm basically in the pregnant woman's ICU for five weeks. You know, I'm literally 30 feet from the OR, and we still almost lost the baby. Right. Um, he was born with an APGAR of two wow. by the time. And they, the, they even told me, like, with how hypoxic he was, like, that right. they were just in time. And so, for me, that was a big eye-opener, like, being in, you know, one of the best medical facilities in the Portland metro area, literally next to the OR. Like, and that's it, how quickly this stuff happens. Oh enough. yeah, it's almost Oh, yeah. So, it wasn't even... Had I been out of the hospital, it's like, had I been on another floor, we wouldn't right. have gotten him, you know. Or the other end of the hall. You know, exactly. You know. And you never know. Like, my best friend has five kids, and all of them, you know, before her last one, you know, half of them, she didn't even have epidurals. Quick, easy. Right. You know, she's a pro. Mm-hmm. And her fifth one, she had a, ended up having to have a C-section. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know. Well, it, uh, in these situations, quantity does not mean, it's not like a... Uh, driving a car practice right. does not mean that you know, every yeah. child right. is individual and every pregnancy is going to be an individual problem with its own hurdles. And I will say this about her friend, that woman's crowd control skills are amazing. Well, her, kids yeah. Yeah. Her, her kids have been over, uh, been over here for birthday parties. We love to have them. They're right. awesome, awesome group of kids and her ability to control a birthday party is spot on. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's oh, yeah. A pro. I have a friend who has four children. And his kids would be acting up at the grocery store, and he just he'd be standing there reading a magazine. He just go, hand, 
and they would all stop what they're doing and put their hands on the cart. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and this lady in front goes, I have two children. I don't have that kind of control right, over yeah, them. He goes, that. yeah, it's, yeah, he, that they just knew that when he turned around and said that, he, did, he goes, I don't do it very often because I don't have to, but if they're acting up, yeah. he goes, that's all I'd have to say. And they all stop what they're doing, put their hand on the cart. And that was their indicator. So we have natural birth, we have vaginal birth, or vaginal birth and C-section. Mm-hmm. I really think that's all of our options for delivering, isn't it? No. Oh. I can't think of any other holes they can come out of. So right. straight fist arm down the throat, I guess. Right. You know. Okay, so um diseases. Vaginal diseases. Ooh, like STDs. yeast infections? Yeast infections are well, it's not really a disease, that's an infection. It's a disease, right? <laughs> uh yeast infections come about when you have an imbalance. So Everybody's body has natural bacteria on it and in it. It helps regulate everything. Your gastric system has bacteria in it. When you hear about like uh, Activia yogurt keeping you keeping you regular, this is why it keeps you regular. Is that they actually have bacteria in there to help keep you. Are we plugging Activia yogurt now? No, is this, is this a sponsor? we are wide open for sponsorship if anybody's interested. Jamie Lee so, Curtis, step aside. Exactly, Chris <laughs> Market got this from here. So active, yeah. <laughs> Don't push it too hard. You go. You can't. You can't want it too much. That's true. So, but no. What they're trying to do is they're trying to balance the flora and fauna, or the good Lord, it's not. There's no animals in there. <laughs> uh, the flora in your gastric system. Well, what happens when you take antibiotics? Would be one way for you to get a yeast infection, and your body, the antibiotics kill off one part of that flora in your in your vaginal tract, and the other parts become uh, rampant. You look at me like I'm an idiot. No, no, so, I don't. Yeah. You don't Any want... other ways to get yeast infections? If you have a yeast infection, call your doctor, not an ambulance. That's the only thing I have to say. <laughs> yeah. I'm forced gumping it, and that's all uh, I have to say about that. <laughs> well, yes, Chris, what would be some of the other ways to get a yeast infection? I looked at Jesse for a reason. Uh, if you are, well, okay, some sort of penetrative act. Where it is rampant not clean. intercourse. Right. Well, not rampant, but un- intercourse with somebody who may not be as cleansed as they need to be. Dirty or, intercourse. Or uh, using toys that are oh, not clean. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Using toys. Will you stop giggling like a seven-year-old, please? <laughs> I like that, by the way, we brought you in here for like a measure of maturity. And right. You're giggling <laughs> and you're the 14-year-old boy in the room. I did not see the agenda ahead of time. I could have told you, like, this is not going to go well with me in the room. <laughs> Oh my gosh! So well, Mark I'm is just going to start say, quoting it... me myself and Irene talking about too much cheese on the taco. I don't know. <laughs> so, so what it... Mark is trying to say is butt plugs stay in the butt. Exactly. Well, this is I mean this is something else. I mean, uh, women are taught at a very young age how to wipe themselves when they poop. What are you? I'm sorry, man. Now I'm have... laughing. So if they wipe the wrong way, they can actually introduce fecal matter. Into the vagina, which will cause infections. And Mark, what is the correct way? Do I have a vagina? Front to back. Front to back. So, I'm assuming, yeah, pushing away from the vagina towards the toilet, I guess. I don't know. I don't really know what I was going with that. What you don't want to do is start near your butthole and drag that bacteria forward. No. Not at all. So, uh, STDs. Things like chlamydia, gonorrhea, hepatitis, herpes. Sundays on your topping. Mm-hmm. No toppings, toppings on your Sunday. Sunday. Yeah. Where I go. My <laughs> dyslexic moment. <laughs> so, I mean, these are all sexually transmitted diseases. So, Chris, tell us about your experiences with chlamydia. <laughs> <laughs> I have no experiences with chlamydia. None whatsoever. And which one's the clap? Because I want chlamydia. to say chlamydia. Are you sure? Chlamydia. Yeah, I'm pretty, pretty sure it's chlamydia. They got the clap. <laughs> I don't really. know. I can talk oh, more about uh, pregnancy uh, complications. Exactly. I'm not a... <laughs> no, I'm Googling the clap. Gonorrhea is actually also called the clap. Oh, okay. Yeah. Maybe it is. I don't... It could be gonorrhea, too. Yeah. Um, chlamydia is the most reported sexually transmitted disease, bacterial infection in the United States. 1.4 million chlamydia cases just in 2011. And that's just uh Are they both called the clap? Which one or am no, I, I think, wrong? I think gonorrhea is. is it gonorrhea? Yeah, I, well, yeah. I don't want to Gonorrhea gotta, is also known I gotta as get the it drip. straight, so I'm not Yeah, because it tends to cause yeah, the, the, and that's not in a good way. The problem with chlamydia is that the bacterium infects the cervix, so you can do damage to the cervix. 
you know. Yes, it can mess up your baby making supplies. Right. Uh, Then it can also spread up to the urethra, uh, into the uterus, and the fallopian tube. So these are all, you know, things that you need to take care of. But the problem is, is that it's most commonly uh, no symptoms in 75% of the women. You don't have any symptoms. You can have vaginal discharge, uh, which may have an odor, just for... The drip. Right. Uh, rectal pain, discharge Ooh. or proof bleeding. Pain during urination. And here's one that... Inflamed eye. <laughs> <laughs> seemed uh, as a weird kind of side effect. Well, I mean, you go to the bathroom, you're not paying attention, you touch your face. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. I'll give you that. Go on. So, you also have gonorrhea. Gonorrhea, some of the symptoms of gonorrhea can be, uh, good lord, I just had a shut down. Uh, again, 50% of the times in men, it just shows no signs of symptoms. Uh, yellowish, white, or green, white discharge. Yeah, that sounds fantastic, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Again, uh, rect- uh, rectal pain uh, in women. Increased bloody yellowish or watery green vaginal discharge, hence why it's called the drip. Yeah, no, that makes sense. You know, again, inflamed dye. <laughs> <laughs> uh, rectal pain discharge, and also a sore throat. <clears> hmm. <throat> yeah. So, these are all treatable. Penicillin, I believe, is the uh, number one treatment. Yes. Yeah. I remember college. Yes, thank you from the 1940s. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. What are your... No, no it's... Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> Chris not, is very interested not in uh, Jesse's history. Not me. I was just going to say that penicillin... Um, no, I when I uh, joined a sorority freshman year, we had like one of our icebreaker events, and like half the girls wouldn't go outside because it was too sunny, and I couldn't figure out, and they were all on, on antibiotics. antibiotics for certain communicable diseases, <laughs> and uh, they were told not to go in the sun because it made them super sensitive right. to the sun, um, but yeah, finding out that like half my sorority was on penicillin for a v- variety of STDs, uh, which is why I never dated a single frat guy in college, so it was a good, uh, good lesson, it was like an in-person commercial. Did you date frat guys after college? I That's, did not. Because she, she, by that time, we were together. Yes. And Chris is nowhere near the quality of frat boy. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I may be hard to hard to stomach sometimes, but I'm not right. a frat boy. Yeah, not a frat boy. So, so um, hey, but if you're a frat boy listening to this podcast, we so love you guys. We support you, and we think you're a wonderful human being. And yeah. go get tested. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, one of the things, so, and also like syphilis is a, another uh, STI out there. And one of the things is these used to be diseases uh, that were difficult to treat before the advent and common usage of things like penicillin. Right. That could result in, especially in the case of syphilis, long term uh, disability or death. Right. These are things that can happen. And nowadays, it's just something you get for the summer while you're in college. Right. Well, I mean, it, in men, it could cause impotence. Mm-hmm. Uh, it could actually cause insanity. I thought it was whiskey. Impotence and whiskey? Personal story? <laughs> no. Uh, it could actually cause short-term and long-term impotence. It could cause insanity. People who go insane from having syphilis. Uh, Al Capone, I believe, died from a syphilis infection. I have no information on that. Bring did you the keep Google. your phone somewhere else? No. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know we could bring our phones. I'd have a lot more answers to some of these questions. <laughs> you think we actually know any of this They're stuff? They're cheating, yeah, really. officially. They're like cheating. We're verifying. Pop That's quizzing me over here, and I have hey, no you phone have, a friend. You knew before, five minutes before the podcast, you were coming in today. Right. So yes. your lack Lots of preparation is on Lots you. Lots of prep so. time. Um, so, yeah, syphilis was be very, very bad. Uh, you also have uh, herpes, which is uh, herpes simplex. Or no, herpes simplex is actually a cold sore. But if it's on the uh, on the vagina or on the genitalia, it then becomes, and I'm drawing a blank here, but it is herpes. The problem with herpes is it's a virus, and so you carry it with you at all times. If you've ever had a cold sore and then it went away, you're not cured of having a cold sore. It's just dormant. And the same thing with vaginal or, or genitalia, uh, genitalia herpes is that you are always a carrier. Now, generally, you're not going to be a, you're not going to be able to transmit this to another person unless you're having an outbreak. But this is something that, because it can do long-term damage to your genitalia if you don't get it treated properly. There are now new medications, antivirals, which will help 
uh, keep these in remission so that you decrease the chance of being able to transmit that to other people. Mm -hmm. And there's a HPV. They've got mm -hmm. the new um, vaccination for that. Right. So uh, we'll see good good things come from that. I recently saw a movie where they went to a strip club that was called Hot Psycho Vixens. And then on the sign out front, it was a uh, picture outline of a woman in uh, thrust and tubing, and, uh, their neon tubing. And then it just said HPV across the bottom of it. And they're walking <laughs> and they goes, oh, that's unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Al Capone did contract syphilis, which turned into neurosyphilis, mm -hmm. uh, which caused him to have dementia for the last few bits of his life. But... It was actually a stroke that doesn't say whether or not the stroke, the neurosyphilis played a role in that or not. But it's actually a stroke. Um, that killed him? Yeah, it was kind of the last thing that happened. He kind of lost his facil facilities, which then made him more susceptible to pneumonia, got pneumonia, cardiac arrest. Right. So. So. Uh, and, you know, then the last really STD we're going to talk about today was going to be uh, HIV or AIDS. Uh, still an epidemic. In parts of the world, uh, there are have been uh, new uh, medications that come out to help control this. There are actually people who, a number of people who uh, have HIV but are undetectable. Their levels are kept so low they're considered. Now you <clears throat> may hear, you may hear, <laughs> you may hear things like, "Well, undetectable is untransmittable," and that is not actually a true statement. That's if not. you are a carrier of disease, you can always transmit it to somebody else. Yeah. And HIV stands for uh, Human Immunodeficiency Virus. And what HIV does is it basically destroys your body's ability to fight other diseases. To the point that when it first became an outbreak, uh, it was being called the gay pneumonia because it wasn't the HIV that kills you. It was the infection that you got. Yeah. And so AIDS itself isn't a virus. AIDS is a result of HIV. AIDS stands for Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. And AIDS is the result of having HIV. Rampant HIV. Yeah. There are also medications out now, antivirals, that can decrease your chance of catching HIV. Mm -hmm. And uh, this has become a very uh, popular medication if people are sexually active, especially gay men. If they're sexually active, it's called PrEP. Prophylactic exposure, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. But anyway, they can be on this medication, but they have to take it in a very regimented way. Uh, they have to be tested to make sure that they don't have the disease to first in the first hand because it's a different set of medications that you'd be on if you actively have the disease. And then even if you are on the medication, it doesn't make you immune. It just decreases the likelihood of you being able to catch the disease. So you still need to use good practices while you're having your sex. So PrEP is pre-exposure prophylaxis. Thank you. And that is a medication called uh, Truvada. That's the brand name anyway. Right. And so this is boosts your uh, ability to fight off viral infections. So, okay, so we've had a baby tonight, multiple ways. <laughs> Um, got an STD. Got an STD. Always multiple SPDs. Oh, it's a good Friday night. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Slept with fat boys? Exactly. Right. Well, you anyway. Pregnant, STDs. Yeah. yeah. Regrets. Chris, what's next? Nothing for me. Nothing from you? You got no. nothing else for this this evening? I didn't have a lot for this evening. Okay. I made a pretty good show, I think. It probably really helped to upgrade the show. I yeah. gotta tell you, less Chris, better show. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so, Jesse, anything else you want to talk about this evening? I think that's. Anything else you want to giggle through this evening while we're talking about this? Or? Well, I can't, can't even do that without laughing. I just... So I think I've got I've I've gone through everything I want to get through. So thank you for listening. As always, uh, we are on Twitter at Medside Stuff. Email us at Medside Stuff at yahoo.com for questions, concerns. You can email us complaints. Probably won't read them, right? But, you know, because we're perfect. No, absolutely. Uh, and as always, uh, future ideas or shows for future uh, ideas for future shows. Well said, Mark. <laughs> Nailed uh, it. But yes, email us. We do read them all, as in we haven't had one yet. <laughs> we will read them all. We have read them all. If we don't that? respond to you, that doesn't mean that, that does not mean that we haven't read the emails. So, thank you for listening, and have a good day. Toast. 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 Oh, no. There you go. Thank you, Jesse. I had to bring it home. I'm just glad I got to talk about butt plugs at least once. Jeez. Oh,